Next up, Mr. Christian Browner. Hey. So I just came back from Paris yesterday evening, and the first thing I saw on Twitter about this conference is that Leonard is going to steal our home directories. It was great news. Uh, no joking, you've been talking about this for the last couple of weeks and months already. Um, right, I'm Christian. Uh, I write code. I work for Canonical right now. Uh, I may mostly do upstream kernel work. I also maintain uh, Lexi and Lexi container runtimes you might know about. Um, and we do a lot of work in the upstream kernel for new container features, security, crossing a bunch of subsystems, also maintaining a few bits and pieces. And this is work we've been doing over the last couple of kernel releases. Um, I've spoken about this for the first time, I think, in depth at, the, at Linux Plumbers a couple of weeks ago. Um, and this is a concept which we call uh, PIDFDs. Who has heard of that, by the way? Ah, some people read LWN. Okay, so um, in short, what is a PIDFD? Um, the idea is it's a file descriptor referring to a process. Don't worry, I'm going to go into details what other systems had that before and so on. It's not a super novel idea. Um, so a file descriptor referring to a process, and specifically right now it's a file descriptor that refers to a threat group leader. Um, if you have any questions about this or stuff, you can just like yell right away. Um, Right, uh, which refers to a threat group leader. So right now, but we don't exclude the possibility to do this in the future, is um, to make it possible, it's not possible to make a file descriptor refer to a single thread. Reason for this being that uh, at the time when we started doing this work, there was no real reason to do it. Nobody really wanted it um, or yelled we want it. And also it would have made the whole code a lot more complicated. So threat group leaders in the kernel are really horrible um, in general. Uh, so it's a stable, stable private handle. Um, so the file descriptor, a PID file descriptor, uh, guarantees that uh, you maintain a reference to the same process as long as you hold that FD open. Um, and it works in a very specific way. I will go into this in a little more detail uh, in a little bit. Um, and PIDFDs use a pre-existing uh, stable process handle that the kernel already knows about, uh, which is struct pit. Um, so it's already used in, in proc uh, to pin a process. So all the proc pit directories stash away a reference to struct pit. So the first question, if you know a little bit about the kernel, you might ask why are we not using a task struct? Ideas, takers? So struct pit in, in the kernel is a way, uh, it's, it's the kernel's idea. If you read the comment in, in the code, it's the, it's the kernel's way of maintaining a stable process handle, um, but without having to pin task struct. Why is that a problem? If you look at task struct in the kernel, it's like this chunk of code. And there's like lists in there and pointers and probably arrays and all that kind of <coughs> stuff. Um, and so struct pit is a cheap way of getting around the problem of pinning, having to pin a lot of memory um, in, in the kernel for a long time. Because sometimes there are various code paths in the kernel that take references on struct pit to keep it alive uh, because they need to look at some information or need to look who's the threat group leader or who's the session leader or, and so on. Um, so struct pit has a bunch of members. You already see something interesting in there, which we added, which is wait queue for PIDFD notification. We will get to this in a bit. Uh, and the idea is from a struct PID, you can get to all of the interesting task structs, which reference um, a type of PID that you're interested in. So the kernel this difference, uh, makes difference between a threat group leader, a process group leader, and a session ID leader. And you can uh, you reference struct PID. There's an array in there, which is... Um, can get, you can get from a struct PID, right, with hlist head, tasks, PID type max, um, you can get to all the, t all the uh, PIDs that are used. Um, yes, you can get to all the task structs um, that are used by this struct PID for a, specific, uh, for a specific process type. So you can get at the process group leader, you can get at the session ID leader, or the threat group leader, uh, depending on what information you need. So uh, that's a PIDFD. PIDFD stashes a reference to struct PID. 
doesn't go away. Um, and why do this in the first place? I mean, this is usually the first question. I would have been happy to just write it for my own entertainment, but um, we actually had a bunch of use cases. The first one that is pretty obvious and it comes up, even though it's always heavily debated uh, whether or not this is a real issue and there are other ways to fix it, but is pit recycling. So avoid pitfalls, uh, pitfalls of pit recycling on high pressure systems. Um, pit allocation, pit number allocation, I should be precise, in the kernel works cyclically. Um, that means the kernel keeps on ramping up the pit number until it hits the maximum number uh, of uh, pits on the system and then it wraps around and takes the next free uh, pit number. So if you have a lot of processes exiting and so on and you can get in a situation where you, uh, where you can have a process whose pit has been recycled while you're still operating under the assumption that it's actually the prior process that you're operating on. Um, this is useful, this is basically, you can use this to have timing-based attacks, of which we actually had quite a few. So there is one against which Jan found against uh, um, Android's GetPitCon. Um, so you could trick it into operating on the wrong security context, if I remember it correctly. There are actually two bugs related to this, or two CVEs related to this, the first two. Um, so you can have a look at that if you're interested. Um, there are a bunch of pit-based Mac exploits, so which, which I didn't know about. So macOS doesn't have, as far as I know, doesn't have uh, the concept of a process file descriptor. Um, there's a bunch of stuff in Qt uh, that had problems with this. Um, there are a bunch of, yeah, the last ones are actually hardware service manager arbitrary, yeah. The last ones are the get pit um, exploits. I think the first one might actually be um, for Polkit. Uh, which you could attack with this as well. So this is really an issue. Um, one thing you can prevent this to make it at least more, uh, less likely to run into this issue is bump the maximum number of pits to uh, 4 million. I think which systemd started doing at some point. You could also probably get around this problem by using UUIDs and not uh, file descriptors. There was a lot of discussions going on how exactly uh, we, uh, we should solve this problem. So we went with PITFDs. Um, and I'm going to explain why, I think, which is a good reason why. So pit recycling, that was one of the issues we really, really wanted to get around. Um, and why do this in the first place? Uh, again, uh, there were a bunch of other reasons. Um, one uh, thing that came up repeatedly was shared libraries. I want to allow... I want to spawn off invisible helper processes. What does this mean? So an exit notification on Linux works in the following way. And if any, oh, by the way, if anyone knows more than me, please yell as well. Um, so you get a sick child signal usually on process exit, right? So that's how you get informed. But for example, if you have a main loop running, like a large main loop running, where you have a lot of callbacks, uh, and one of your callbacks uh, is there to reap uh, helper processes. Now, this callback calls wait, uh, wait PID1, wait ID1, uh, minus one, sorry, which means wait for all my children, or wait ID P all, wait PID minus one, wait ID all. Uh, so it wants to wait for all children, uh, specifically use case that probably in its systems want to have or want to support. Um, but now you can end up in a situation where any other callback in your main loop could have spawned off a helper process and also relies on sick child uh, and exit signals uh, to be received. So now the wrong helper wakes up in your, in your loop, gets a sick child signal and calls wait ID P all and is like, yes, I'm gonna reap all of my children now. And then accidentally reaps someone else's child. The other process now gets confused as to where the hell is my child? So this is really not a nice situation. So it's, uh, forking off invisible helper processes. With some work you can do it, but then you run into issues with, uh, then you run into issues with threat safety and signal handlers. There is a long blog post, I think, from Tiago out there, who is one of the cute project maintainers that want to make use of this features, uh, use of this feature. So uh, pit of these, we'll see how, hopefully. Um, make it possible to spawn up invisible helper process pretty nicely. Uh, they also allow you to get notifications for process exit as a non-parent process in a clean way. 
Um, and process management delegation uh, in general, a hand of a handle to a non-parent process for a bunch of operations that you want to perform, uh, which you cannot safely do right now. You cannot, you, I mean, you can pass a PID, but apart from, if you're the parent, you usually know that this is your child and you can be sure that this is still your child. If you're a non-parent and you have sort of more issues to figure this out, you need to pass through PROC, look at start times, all kinds of hacks. Creu has, has had issues with this for a long time, for example. Um, uh, yes, so uh, hand of a handle to a non-parent process for waiting, signaling, whatever, which if you have an FD as a stable private handle on a process, that problem should go away. Um, another reason why we did go with FDs, um, the ubiquity of FDs, which sounds like a trivial argument, but um, it's actually not, I think. Um, there are common patterns everywhere in code bases. Uh, that make use of FDs. So most people have an ePoll loop to listen for events on file descriptors. Most people have parsing logic to parse out FD info from proc self, FD, FD number, and then FD info or something. Um, and have logic for sending around file descriptors via SCM writes and so on. So there is not a lot of adapting that you have to do. If you would have to build UUIDs on top of everything now, then uh, it would have been annoying for the kernel to generate them and handing them out to user space. I know Leonard still wants them very much. You're not going to get them. Um, and uh, so uh, FDs seem to be quite, uh, quite the obvious solution. And also, here's where we uh, in a little bit get into this part, uh, there was prior art for this as well, or similar art before that. So ubiquity of FDs, I think, is a pretty good argument for doing it this way. Uh, and last but not least, does user space really care about this feature? So nowadays, uh, when you try to bring something in, into the kernel, it's usually not that you just get to do it. You usually have to say, like, this is, this is a problem, and people really care about this. Um, so we need a justification for why we wanted to do this, even though it seems obvious that it, uh, it makes a problem go away that is a pretty big deal. Um, yes, user space really cares about this. Some of those have talked to me before, some of those have written mails after, and some of them I just figured out by pure chance by people pointing out, hey, they're making use of this feature. So, and this list keeps growing. One is Dbus. Dbus has an issue open where they want to switch from uh, doing PID-based authentication to uh, PIDFD-based authentication um, because they have issues with PID recycling as well, or at least they're afraid of uh, running into issues with this. Um, Qt wants to use it for sub-process management, so it's management, so it's forking off invisible helper processes, which I mentioned before. Um, system the only issue that I currently know about that is open is using it to reliably kill processes per C group. Um, but they probably have other use cases for this as well in the future. Um, Creo, uh, which uses it to detect pit reuse, or so it has a function that is called detect pit reuse, which is a hack. Correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, and uh, we can. We can switch out this function uh, for uh, PIDFDs, um, using it to re reliably track processes. Uh, Android, low memory, uh, low memory killer daemon, um, is using PIDFDs as well. They were actually one of the first that got really excited about this. It all derived back from a debate. So parts of that, I had an argument with uh, a discussion with Case Cook and uh, I think David Howells a while back in, at Linux. Security Summit uh, somewhere in Edinburgh or something where we, where we talked about various things that we should do or could do and how we, how we should do it, uh, which is where the PIDFD stuff started. Then there was also in parallel a discussion that started on the mailing list where people started to hack around in PROC to make it at least possible to send signals via files and so on. So um, there was a lot happening at the same time and this is ultimately the, the approach that came to fruition. Um, so the Android guys, there is a, you have to give it to Joel, who, is a, who works for Google as a uh, kernel engineer uh, who helped with this work, uh, who helped with this work and who also did a lot of, uh, did a lot of the polling work um, that we'll see in a bit. So low memory killer daemon is using PIDFDs to reliably pro uh, track processes and kill them. Uh, this, is the, this basically runs on Android 10 already. Oh no, not PIDFD, sorry, they will be in Android 11. I backported it to all of the LTS kernels, so, but they're definitely going to use it um, to get around issues where they have to make sure that the process that they are killing is really the process that they want to kill and so on. 
Um, and BPF trays uh, want to switch wants to switch to PDFDs as well. They have an issue uh, open as well. Don't uh, don't just trust me. Click on the links to verify. It. Maybe they're all wrong. Um, and there's prior art. Uh, this goes back to a, a, a former slide, uh, to an earlier slide. Um, why do this in this specific way? Well, uh, there is precedence in other systems, and I th usually think it's not a good idea if you keep deviating too much between different operating system implementations because it makes it horrible for user space that at least try to be compatible across different operating systems um, to write working code. Uh, so I always was under the impression, I, I have to admit, I did something which uh, is not very smart uh, from the perspective of a uh, kernel guy. I didn't look at other kernels before actually starting this work. Um, I did it later. Uh, and we were kind of lucky that we didn't get uh, run, run in a lot of issues they originally run into, but that was just by pure chance and having a lot of smart people yell at our work. Um, but it also means I was falsely under the impression, for example, that Solaris had PIDFDs, which is wrong. They actually have it not, uh, don't have it. Uh, at least the Lumos, the open source implementation of Solaris, um, ha only has a pure user space emulation of stable process handles, proc open, proc run, proc close, and proc free. Um, but they have the same problem, essentially. Um, OpenBSD and NetBSD don't have it. Um, FreeBSD is the only system uh, other than Linux that has it. They have a concept called ProcDesk, Proc File Descriptor, or Proc Descriptor, sorry. And they have three system calls, PD Fork, PD Get Pit, and PD Kill, and they have gone with different decisions, or with the, with, they have taken slightly different decisions than we have on Linux, parts of which are implementation-based, or most of which are implementation-based. And if you have questions about this, I can go into detail, but probably not going to be enough time. PD Fork gives you a backup uh, PID file descriptor, essentially, a PROC file descriptor. And PD Get Pit allows you to translate it to a PID, um, and PD Kill is used to send a signal through one of those file descriptors. And on Linux, there are multiple uh, approaches to get this into the kernel at once. ForkFD, which uh, is, I think, was originally done by uh, Tiago as well from Qt, or at least was one of his uh, suggestions. Um, and then there was another patch set, uh, which is called uh, CloneFD. Uh, none of those made it. Um, and I think one of the reasons they, the patches were fine, they were interesting, um, they had interesting new concepts, um, but for example, CloneFD tried to do a lot of things at the same time, so they mix auto-reaping semantics with uh, file descriptors for processes and so on, so a lot of contention going on on how to actually do this correctly, and I think ultimately it didn't go in um, because it tried to do as much, uh, too many things at once. Uh, maybe there was another reason, I didn't see it from the thread, but there was a lot of stuff in that patch set. Um, so, okay, so we started uh, building a new uh, API around uh, process management, and I want to start with this right away, um, which I also did at LPC. We, my intention has never been to say we have pit of these and we have pits, and they are totally separate worlds, and you either use the one, and, but then you can't use the other which I think is the wrong way to think about this. Um, PIDFDs get around a very specific problem that you have in, in, uh, in multiple but rather specific situations. Um, so you probably you want the way to cross between PIDs and PIDFDs and use it uh, both at the same time. Um, and so it's not like we're deprecating the PID, the PID API and only going to PID of these in the future. That's probably not what's going to happen. Um, it may still, it may be the case, and this is what I expect, that a lot of new interesting features that people care about can be built upon PID of these just by being a stable process handle, um, which you couldn't do, which you couldn't build upon, uh, upon PIDs. Right, so the first thing that we did in 5.1 uh, was implement a new syscall, which is called PID of the, uh, send signal, which allows you to send a signal through a PID of the. Uh, this was the really obvious piece because it's, uh, PID recycling is usually concerned with sending signals, right? Uh, you're operating on something that is not yours. Um, so it's pretty obvious to make the argument, look, this solves an issue, uh, this lets us cleanly solve an issue. It's, Clearly something that user space has run into, there are a bunch of people who pointed this out, that this is an issue for them. Um, so we should, we should do this. Um, and it's actually in a lot of code, as you can see here. Oh, there's a bit more to it down below, but the whole FD handling part is uh, encapsulated in what you see here in the top. 
Um, the first controversy that we had about this was what exactly is the HIDFD going to be? Um, and people had very strong opinions about this, um, which also derives from the fact that it's an obvious problem in the sense, oh, it solves something really obvious, and here's my opinion, and here's how we should do it, and I'm not going to back down. So we kept yelling at each other for a long while, which is usually what happens. Um, and uh, the first uh, idea was to use uh, slash proc slash pit DRFDs. Um, as PIDFDs, because they already pin struct PID, they're pretty easy to get by, um, and it's a nice shortcut. You open, you call open on slash proc slash PID for the, the process you're interested in, um, ignoring for now that this also has PID recycling issues, then you have an FD, it can't, uh, it can't be stolen from you, and then you stuff it into PIDFD send signal, and you send a signal to it. Um, and if uh, the process has exited behind your back and is not back and is not around anymore, and you send a signal, you get ESRch, which is kernel speak for no such process. Um, so this brings me to another point: we don't pin PIDs, we don't pin PID numbers. It doesn't mean that if you when you hold a PID of D, that now your PID is not going to be recycled. Your PID is going to be recycled. We don't care about this. DFD is your stable handle. PID can be recycled. We're not stopping the kernel from doing PID allocation or something. Um, so, right, we use PROCPID as a shortcut of these, um, as sort of a shortcut that is really handy for user space. Um, but then we started, or we already had thought about this. Um, we were faced with implementing the part where you return a file descriptor from one of those nice fork or clone functions that we have on Linux. And here is where we ran into real interesting problem. So this is work, so uh, um, Jan and I started discussing about this um, because he had good input on this. Um, and some people have the opinion, um, clone should just return file descriptors from slash proc slash pid. Sounds straightforward if you ignore all of the security issues, like for example, there's a net directory in proc, in proc pit, which allows you to snoop on uh, the traffic of another process. It's also really horrible in terms of how file systems, and especially the proc file system, works in the kernel. So if you return, if you want to return a proc pit file descriptor, then you have to pre-allocate a dentry. Well, you have to pre-allocate something that the kernel uses internally to refer to a file, and then later on splice it into proc. It's, believe me, it was really nasty code. Um, so what we did was uh, we, we showed our preferred implementation and we showed the implementation that some people preferred and uh, wrote both implementations, which was a lot of work. Um, the one implementation showed slash proc pit file descriptors used as pit of these and the other one showed our implementation and that was like really, if you compare it, it's like this much code and then you have this much code. And so people were like, yes, let's go with the implementation that you wanted, which was lucky for us. I think it saved us a lot of headache, and I would have been very unhappy. Actually, I considered if we go with proc pit directories, if I'm going to abandon this. But um, we didn't, so we got lucky. So in 5.2, this is where we landed support for returning uh, file descriptors from clone function, from the clone function. Um, uh, we were always under the impression that all of the clone flags were gone. Ha, no, there was one left. Um, which no one knew. I mean, we, we, only, uh, we only saw this uh, because Linus pointed it out. No, there is one flag bit left. I always assume we're out, but okay. So uh, we added a new flag called clone PIDFDs, which creates PIDFDs at process creation time to completely let you get, lets you get rid of the race um, uh, where your PID can be recycled. Um, they have a bunch of interesting properties. I'm going to be talking about this in a little bit. Uh, this is more or less, there are a bunch of more places that we had to touch or that I had to touch, but overall, uh, this is the code that you see in the kernel internals uh, clone function or fork function in this case. So ignore the comment for now, but if the flag is set, you allocate a new file script and you return to user space. It stashes away a reference to a struct pit, which is a kernel internals uh, notion of a stable reference on a process file descriptor. Um, and you see these are anon inode file descriptors. If you, have a, if you use a timer FD, if you use an event FD, if you use a signal FD, if you use an FD for the new mount API, um, and there is probably a bunch more I'm forgetting, uh, ah, the seccomp notifier FD, they're all uh, anonymous inode based, um, which is it's just a single inode in the kernel that gets allocated when the kernel boots up, and then you can uh, get a new file from this, so the inode number is the same for all of them. 
basically means you don't need to allocate an inode um, and it's, that's why it's very cheap. It doesn't waste memory, it doesn't waste uh, allocation time and so on. So this is, uh, this is ideal more or less. Um, you stash, stash away a bunch of operations you want to allow in that file descriptor. So this is the pid of the f op stuff. Um, pid is the struct pid that I talked about. Um, so it's pretty simple code overall. And uh, one of the things that we also did is we made pid of these close, close on exec by default. So if you get, get a pid of back, you really want to be sure that it doesn't leak into uh, the child process when it execs, for example. Um, and uh, yeah, so this is, what, this is what we did. And I think if you think about uh, any new file descriptor type that you bring into the kernel, please make it close on exec by default. Um, I tried to convince people to do this for the mount API didn't fly well, um, but uh, it, it really helps user space. It's one of the major pain points, actually, that you get file descriptors that stay open after you exec. Um, and close on exec is really easy to set. Like, this is all it takes. Oh, read, write, OCLO, exec. And then you get an OCLO, exec file descriptor back. Really makes life easier in user space. And another property is that we added an FD info file. So uh, the FD info file will contain the pit of the process as seen from the pit namespace with which your proc mount uh, was mounted. So any proc mount, especially in containers, is attached to the container's pit namespace, if you remount it at least. Um, and in a new pit namespace, uh, the pit that the process has will be different from the one that it has in, this, in one of the ancestor pit namespaces. Um, and so we write it in there. So if you parse it, you will get the pit of that process in um, your uh, in your proc instance, which is, for example, helpful if you sent around a pit of D uh, and it was created in another pit namespace, then um, this is how you get the pit. But we also made it such, and this is, uh, was Alex's idea, uh, Alex Nesterov's idea. Um, originally, we had it implemented in a way that when you set clone pit of D, you got uh, a file descriptor instead of a pit, which is problematic in multiple ways because file descriptors start at uh, zero, and uh, zero is obviously used to differentiate between the child and the parent. So you cannot really return zero as a valid file descriptor. Uh, so uh, pit of Ds would have started uh, at one, which is not nice. So uh, for legacy clone, we uh, made it such that we abuse one of those uh, return arguments it has, uh, where usually the TID uh, of the parent process, the TID of the child process is placed uh, to return a pit of D. So if you set clone pit of D, you get the pit back, and you get the pit of D back at the same time. So you have no disconnect. You know both at the same time, which I think is pretty nice. Um, it's even a little bit nicer, I think, than FreeBSD's uh, PD fork. And then in 5.3, uh, I think this is really exciting. We added, Joel added polling support. This is something that they really wanted for their low memory killer daemon, so that you can get exit notification for non-parents. Um, and in a more complex sense, it allows you to turn off the exit signal, which means that when a process exits, you can tell the kernel already today um, that I don't want a sick child. I don't want a sick child signal. I'm not going to explicitly ignore it because then you would auto reap it. I just don't want a signal when the process exits, uh, which was a bit problematic because then how you know when the child is exited and so on. And uh, the polling support will allow you to do this because what it essentially does is as soon as the process uh, exits, um, so as the threat group leader exits and the threat group is empty, then you get an exit notification saying, uh, I'm ready, um, I have exited. So if you hand off one of those pit of Ds to a non-parent process, you get reliable exit notification uh, and you don't need to rely on sick child signals and so on, which is pretty nifty. Also pretty small code, it's not a lot to do. Um, this is actually in two different files, doesn't matter, you can grab for it if you're really interested in, uh, in it. Um, it's the polling implementation. Uh, so yeah, the one caveat that we have, poll us only when the whole threat group exits. Um, if the threat group leader exits before a lot of threats in the group, then polls should block similar to the weight family. That's actually a problem you can run into, and that's why threat group leaders are not really nice. Um, but yeah, polling support is pretty exciting for process management. Uh, and in 5.3, we added uh, another syscall, um, right, another syscall, um, PIDFDs without clone, PIDFD, um, PIDFD open. The idea being that uh, when you have forked the process, um, you sometimes still want to create a PIDFD, uh, especially if you want to watch uh, a bunch of other processes, PIDs, 
and you can't rely on them using clone PIDFD. PIDFD open will allow you to do just that. It gets you a new PIDFD. Um, it also verifies that you give it a threat group leader so you don't can you can't get a, a PIDFD uh, for a threat. Um, yeah, that's uh, 5.3. And 5.4. Um, excellent. That was proposed. That's actually no longer true. Linus pulled it from me. So um, we have that in. Um, you can now wait on processes through PIDFDs. Uh, so you can pass, wait ID has gained a new flag, P PIDFD. Um, you pass it a PIDFD instead of a PID, um, and then it retrieves it, and then it waits on the PIDFD, um, which I think is, um, is pretty neat. And we have a bunch of work, uh, we had work planned. There are some work that I've, there's a lot of work that, uh, or ideas that I have. I'm just going to speak uh, about two of them. This at least came up um, as one of the original ideas, or the first ideas um, that we had was to make it possible, similar to what FreeBSD has. So on FreeBSD, um, if you have a PID file descriptor, if you have a process file descriptor, it is a kill on close by default, which means if you close the last file descriptor, which has a reference to the corresponding struct file in the kernel, then it will kill the process. That has, it killed the process, uh, which is pretty neat. Um, I wanted to do it the other way around, so b per default, that's not that's not the default. So uh, if you close the last bit of deed, and still uh, things are still fine. Um, but we could add a flag uh, that is set at process creation time. You can take it away afterwards, so no PR cuddles or the PR cuddles or that nonsense. Um, and then you kill the process when the file descriptor is closed. There is a problem, though, that is, has been bothering me and that I've been thinking about is, so on uh, FreeBSD, Closing file descriptors is synchronous, so that means when close returns and that FD was the last reference to the struct file inside of the kernel, then by the time close returns, you can be guaranteed that all of the cleanup operations have finished. Um, Linux is um, smarter in some ways, or let's say complicated maybe, in the sense that close can return without the corresponding release or cleanup method that belongs to the struct file that the last FD referred to has been run. It adds it to a work queue uh, or a K thread, uh, and then at some point when the kernel thinks, ah, oh, it's fine, I have some, have some time to run this right now, then it cleans up everything. Um, so that means if you close the last of the closed returns, you are not guaranteed that the process is dead, which is not ideal, but usually, usually the kernel cleans it up like really quickly or calls the release method for the corresponding file uh, fairly quickly. It should only delay it when there's a lot of memory pressure, for example, in which case you're screwed anyway. So, um, and another thing which is for the shared library case, uh, is exclusive waiting. So right now, anyone can still wait on the process that you forked off either via PID uh, or uh, via a PIDFD. There is no differentiation there right now. And I think that just makes sense because then you have this connection between the PIDFD and the PID, PID API. But there should be a way to say, I'm now going to separate this connection. Uh, and exclusive waiting would allow you to do this. So you have something like clone wait PID, flag name, open for discussion, uh, which hides the process from generic wait requests. This is similar to what, um, to what FreeBSD has as well, but I actually would like to make it stronger, uh, which derives back from a discussion I had with Eric a while back. Um, so you would only be able to wait on a process through a PIDFD. Um, as long as there is a PIDFD referring to it, and when the last PIDFD is gone, the process gets auto-reaped. Oh, do you know auto reaping semantics? Thank you. So auto reaping semantics really, it's not, you explicitly, you set sick child, you ignore sick child explicitly. You say, I'm, I don't want sick child, but I explicitly tell you that I don't want sick child, at which point the kernel is, says, okay, then I'm going to clean up that process for you. If it exits, then it exits. Um, and it's gone, which is really neat. Uh, it's different, for example, on FreeBSD, which is why they have chosen to implement proc file descriptors a little bit differently. If, uh, if you explicitly ignore sick child on, uh, on FreeBSD, then the process doesn't get auto cleaned up by the kernel. It gets reparented to PID1, and PID1 then gets a signal for that process, which is basically saying, like, I'm done, you take care of it. 
Um, whereas Linux re really cleans it up. So it would be really nice if you have clone wait PID. As long as you have a PID of D, you can wait on the process explicitly. If you close the last PID of D, telling the kernel, I don't care about this process anymore. If this process exits, uh, just clean it up. Uh, the problem is the implementation usually. <laughs> uh, it's, it's pretty tricky to get right. Um, I think, but I might put a patch set up there soonish. And there's a bunch of other ideas, um, but I'm, I, I could keep talking, but I probably shouldn't. Um, so, yeah, so this is what we built over the last couple of kernel releases. We're at 5.4. We've obviously also been fixing a lot of bugs along the way, uh, so this wasn't a whole bug-free process, but overall I think um, it was pretty good. It was also a good, a pretty good collaboration effort. A lot of people took part in the discussions, brought in uh, really good ideas, uh, gave uh, gave reviews and uh, and help with this. So uh, I could probably give a shout out to a lot of people um, here. But yeah, that's about it. So if you have questions, go at it. Yes. So what about integration with uh, CM credentials and uh, other places where you send a PID to someone else? What do you mean? Could, could we have a flag where a CM credentials contains a PID FD instead of a um, PID? Couldn't you just, you can just send it as a regular FD. Why you want a special flag? Uh, because, uh, well, it's, it gets sent implicitly. Uh, you set some flags on the socket and then it, the kernel does the job for you. And this, it is possible that the, by the time the, oh. the consumer looks at this data, the PID could be uh, oh. not valid anymore. Oh, so you're saying the PID is sent implicitly, but instead of a PID, you now want the PID of D. I don't, from the top of my head, I don't necessarily see a problem with this, yes? I guess the problem is like for instance like a process sends a log message to Giorno and dies so at that time Giorno wants to look at the process to figure out which C group it was running which services ah, yeah, yeah. I remember this yeah. okay um, right. trying to think if yeah we should probably talk about this it shouldn't be uh, it shouldn't be something that is I wouldn't put this off the table it sounds uh, it sounds useful if there is a really good use case for it and it doesn't really complicate in kernel code too much so that I have reason to like a good cost to justify us uh, it should be fine um, I have a similar question which is we now have pdfds right. and namespace fds um, but for the namespace SD we have to go through the file system procfs to yes. get them is there a way to derive a uh, namespace FD from a PDFD? <laughs> Maybe I have plans for that. <laughs> so it's, it's a feature request. Can you do that? <laughs> um, one of the things that, always, that has always bothered me is um, <clears throat> if you do a set and S uh, into a namespace, uh, you have to do it iteratively, right? So it, actually iteratively in, in two stages. You have to call open like seven times nowadays. And then you have to call set an S seven times, and often in the correct order. And uh, that's obviously a problem. Well, I see it as a problem. Uh, may maybe some people don't see it as a problem. I think this is the wrong approach. It, ideally, we could change. I had once had the idea, or played with the idea, I may have mentioned it on the mailing list at some point, too, is if ZNS would take a PID of D and interpret the type argument that it has right now as a flag argument, so you could specify the namespaces that you want to attach to, and then it derives it from the PID of D in kernel and gets you into all of those namespaces, which would make attaching for containers and so on way nicer. Yes, that's definitely something um, which has been on my mind. It's usually that now it becomes a battle of the maintainers, as I would like to call it, because then it's, you know, we need to agree with does Eric think this is a good idea? How exactly does the API should look, uh, should look like and so on? Um, but overall, I, yes, that's something I definitely uh, have uh, thought about. I also have thought about just recently um, forking into namespaces. 
actually, I shouldn't claim this completely uh, uh, for me. Um, David Howell suggested this once um, uh, in a discussion. So ideally, at clone time, you say not just create me a set of new namespaces, but create me a process in this set of namespaces. Um, but there needs to be a strong justification for why we would need this. Like, is there some security issue or something when you create a process and then you do all of the set and stuff on it and so on? Um, yeah, that's definitely um, something we can think about. Um, yes. Hello, a question on um, uh, kill on close feature. Yeah. Uh, is it dangerous if the process, the shell process, exit uh, set UID program and become more privileged, and then the parent can kill it? Can the parent then kill it? Yes. He, uh, in the uh, naive implementation that I prototyped, yes, because it's an internal signal, right? Um, so there is no there is no security disconnect. So but, yes. So the question is uh, the answer is yes. It would just kill the set UID program that you spawned, even if it runs with more privileges for now. Um, I even haven't thought about this, but I haven't worked on this in a lot more detail. If you have specific concerns about this, we should probably uh, we should probably talk. Um, not at the moment, just curious. So one of the things that I really want, and this is important, I think, um, is we have this tendency on uh, Linux, and this may be a good thing, in some situations it's a good thing, in some situations it's a bad thing, where we, for example, we create, especially with processes, we create a process with a specific property, and then later on we add a PR cuddle, I'll, I'll be done in a sec, and then we do a PR cuddle, and that PR cuddle takes that property away from the process which is horribly annoying. Like if I, as a parent, say I'm creating a new process with these properties set, then this property needs to stick to this process. It, it can't be taken away anymore after the fact, which is the thing what I want to do with the clone weight, p uh, weight pit, for example, the uh, close on kill flex. It's a property that sticks to the process as long as it's alive, and if it's gone, it's, it's gone. I don't want to end up in a scenario where suddenly you can change all bits and pieces and flags uh, again on processes. So I want sticky properties, uh, essentially. I would like that, if it's useful at least. Yeah. So, Christian Browner, thank you very much. Okay, so if you create a child process and then you send a PDFD to that process to some other process, does the parent then get a sick child uh, notification if the other process wants an exit notification that you just added in 5.3? 5, 5 uh, so do both processes get notified when the process exits one over PDFD and the parent over normal sick child? If you have said sick child, yes, if you want that, but you can explicitly turn it yeah, off. Yeah, I want it yeah. in a parent. Okay, thank you. Yes. Anyone? Yeah, so these are just a, a few remarks while doing this work. So just uh, forgot that slide. Okay. Thank you very much. <laughs>